Elden Ring's got a ton of boss fights. I mean, it's even got more bosses than the entire Dark Souls trilogy combined. Now, if you know me, I prefer quality over quantity, and let's just say Elden Ring doesn't really agree with me there. Now, let me specify some things for this ranking. First off, I'm only going to rank bosses that I consider important. For example, most bosses on this list give you an achievement for beating them, or are just required to beat the game. The point is, I'm not going to rank a boss like Soldier of Godric, because there are like a billion bosses in Elden Ring, and I'd probably rot to death if I were to make that video. Finally, following the same rules as I did in my last video, by the way you should watch that video if you haven't already, in order to rank the bosses in the most objective way possible, I'll be playing as a basic knight with just a sword and shield. No one-shotting bosses as a mage, <laughs> No overpowered bleed, rivers of blood, double uji katana, twin blade seppuku bullshit. No summons, just plain Elden Ring. Anyways, enough talking. Let's get to the boss rankings. The worst boss in the entire game is... I'll start my list off with a pretty reasonable take here. If any of you have fought the gargoyles with no summons, you'll understand why I consider this boss to be absolutely horrible. These two guys are good contenders for the top 5 worst bosses in any FromSoft game. They check off all the fatal flaws that any boss shouldn't have. Their visual design isn't appealing at all, they aren't fun to play against, and it's just too unforgiving. You'd expect that Miyazaki and FromSoft were able to learn from all their past mistakes with duo bosses, since Elden Ring is supposed to be their magnum opus, but they literally throw everything out the window when they were making these two fucks. It's like if they took the gargoyles from Dark Souls 1 and curb stomped them while pissing and shitting on their bodies. Not to mention, the valiant gargoyles are just two rehashed enemies slammed inside a shoddy arena. Let me say this though, when the fight first starts, it's actually not that bad. I'd say it's a mediocre boss at best, but it's definitely not horrible. But once you get the first gargoyle that's around half health, he spawns in his twin blade friend. Well you might think, oh it won't be that bad, it'll just be like the demon princes from Dark Souls 3, right? That would be great, right? But guess what? They found out a way to fuck it up. First off, they fucked up the enemy AI for the two gargoyles. You see, normally in duo fights you have one enemy be aggressive towards you, hitting you with melee attacks while the other guy is in a more passive state, maybe shooting a slow range attack at you. Well in this fight, I swear, these two guys just don't give you a break. They are extremely aggressive and even double team you at times, which I think shouldn't be allowed. And about that slow range attack I was talking about a second ago, well that ranged attack is a hard to spot area of effect attack which ticks your health down from virtually any direction. And get this, it poisons you too. Like what were they genuinely thinking? Even if a gargoyle isn't using this attack at a far distance, one could just randomly pop this attack right in front of you as the most annoying get off me attack. They literally took the exact same formula with the demon prince's poison attack, but made it 100 times worse. If they had made this attack only be able to poison you, it wouldn't be that bad. They aren't stingy with this attack either. It's not like it just comes out a couple times per fight. They legit spam this attack. This leads to situations where you run around the arena for a couple minutes from this poison attack, and then only manage to find like 2 seconds for a counter attack. Couldn't they have just copied the AI from the Demon Prince's fight or the Gargoyle fight from Dark Souls 1? Those were almost perfect. I'm sorry but I just don't like anything about this fight. It 100% deserves to be the worst on this list. Here is another example of a boss I just despise. Fire Giant is a boss that many people dislike and rightfully so. It's just some big lanky redhead fat ass that doesn't offer anything special. When you first enter the boss arena, the Fire Giant attacks you with his little pot lid thingy well in his first phase. And then once you start fighting him, you start to realize that he's going to play out like a shit boss, and he definitely does. A minute or two during the first phase, you'll break his ankle bracelet and expose his weak spot. Then after even more mindless bashing and him rolling around every couple of seconds, you finally get him into his second phase. This is what I hate about giant fights. The whole gameplay loop is just spamming R1 and waiting until the giant stomps or runs away. It's just so boring to me. Then after that ordeal, a sequence where something just slightly interesting happens when he cuts off his own leg to go into his second phase. And what do you finally get when he phase changes? An even worse version of his first phase. He gets access to the most annoying projectile attacks, AoE get off me attacks, and of course, one hit kill attacks. Meanwhile, this is all happening while he's rolling around the snow, forcing me to scramble all over the boss arena to get a couple hits off of him. Oh, and what's that? You made one slight mistake? Fuck you, get one shot it. And now you have to start the whole 5 minute fight again. Again, just like with the last boss, what were they even thinking when developing this boss? Did any of the game testers actually think Fire Giant was a fun boss? How did they not see these huge frustrating oversights? Nothing about this boss is interesting to me. The music is forgettable, the design of the boss is unappealing to me, and the gameplay is horrendous. I don't even want to talk about him anymore, let's just move on.
Alright, this one's pretty self-explanatory. I mean, at the end of the day, it's an NPC boss fight. You can't really get a good ranking if it's an NPC fight. The reason why this is the worst NPC fight on this list is because there's four guys you need to beat. One at the start, and a triple gank fight at the end. There's three dudes, one with two great axes, one who spams magic and death by at you from a distance, and one dexterous dude. I don't have anything else to say, it's a pretty bad fight. Okay, I know, I know. Another NPC boss fight. I'll try to be quick. So, Mimic Tier is a memorable but terrible boss fight. It's one of those silver tier enemies that can morph into anything, but this time it morphs into you. Any weapons, armors, spells, and consumables you have equipped, the Mimic Tier will have in its loadout. Seems pretty interesting, right? But then you realize it's an NPC fight. Not really anything special going on here. You can either strip butt booty naked and beat it in like 5 seconds, or just fight it with all your gear on. I don't know any reason why you do that, but you can. Alright, I think that's the last of the NPC bosses. Let's move on. Alright, okay, you knew it was coming. Thankfully, this is the last NPC boss on the list, and I'll be quick. Gideon is literally the third to last boss of the game, and they were kinda just spamming bosses in the Ashen Capital, so this guy came out. He's obviously a humanoid enemy and casts spells that he stole from the previous bosses, which is pretty cool. But other than that, and his cool name, that's pretty much it. He has a relatively small health pool, making him pretty easy to take down. I know, I know, some of you might want to kill me right now. Fortisax at number 26 might seem very inaccurate, but let me tell you why he's a bad boss and why he frustrates me. Don't get me wrong though, the arena, the music, the boss's visual design, everything about his aesthetics are top tier. Right off the bat, the red lightning, death light, and an arena that looks like it came out of a goddamn Van Gogh painting is amazing. And then the music just goes like... But once you get into the meat of this boss, you realize that it goes over every annoying game design principle in Elden Ring ever. First of all, it's a dragon boss. Don't get me started on these fights in Elden Ring. The only excellent dragon boss FromSoft has ever made was Madir, but I already covered him in the last video. Second, the fight just has so much bullshit in it that I had trouble even wanting to get the footage for this boss. Anyways, let's begin breaking it down. The Fortisex fight consists of you just poking at dragon feet while he flies across the map, stomps his feet, or just moves his body in the slightest way so you miss your attack. But, all this is happening while a continuous strike of red lightning that is barely telegraphed tracks your position 24-7 across the huge arena. What is this? This is horrible. No, no, don't do this. Stop. This shit is one of the most annoying boss attacks ever. So, while dealing with all this dragon nonsense, you gotta stop attacking Fortisax and focus on dodging the shitty little lightning bolt that repeats every 3 seconds. And this lightning attack does not give a single shit if Fortisax is already attacking you. This means that the lightning can lead to situations like this. Like you see what I mean? I got hit by a normal attack, but since I was stunlocked, I had absolutely no way to dodge the incoming lightning bolt, which is so stupidly infuriating. Another little note, he also has this AoE stomp attack which does no damage but has a ton of stunlock frames, so if he hits you with this while the lightning bolt is active, he can get a cheap hit off of you. Now, Fortisax does have a couple of neat looking attacks like this one where he flies up in the air doing his little lightning glaive spin move, but other than that, it's your generic fire breath and swipe attacks. The only reason, I repeat, the only reason why he's not worse than any of the other bosses on this list so far is because of his overall visuals. That's it. If it were just another dragon, he'd go straight to the bottom. Worse than the goddamn gargoyles. So much wasted potential was shown here. Imagine a boss this cool, this cinematic, this good of a soundtrack existed. Hmm, I wonder where I could find a boss like that. Oh wait. The Regal Ancestor Spirit is a boss that is so close to being mediocre. It's just on edge of escaping the bad tier of bosses in my opinion. It's just a rehash of the unoriginally named Ancestor Spirit, and I think they have the exact same moveset except for this one obnoxious healing move that the Regal one has. If the Regal one didn't have the healing attack, it would just be a mediocre boss. It's got a variety of easy to dodge but fairly boring attacks that look quite awkward to be honest. For most of the fight, you'll be running around the arena while it flies everywhere, regurgitating its bubble shit all over the place. You'll then hit its misshapen and misleading hitbox for around 2 or 3 hits, and then repeat the process. There really isn't anything much to say about this boss. At least it looks kind of charming, I guess?
Man, every time I fight Renala, I just get depressed. There's so much wasted potential for this fight. Could you imagine if we got a sorceress with crazy magic swords and stabs, or being able to dodge moonlight attacks while some sick ass music plays in the background? Oh, what's that? You wanted that to be in the game? Y you wanted it? Well, too bad. Have some fucking scholar lizard toddler looking freaks trying to eat your toes. Like, wh wh what is this first phase, man? Seriously. It's essentially a game of is my headset on as you listen to the tiny toddler people with golden circles around them. And once you hit all three circles, Renala just floats down, making herself vulnerable for a short period of time. It's structured like a Nintendo boss where you just complete a simple task, then attack the bad guy while he's stunned, which is something I never thought I'd say. Anyways, after this first phase, you get transported into this beautiful arena that reminds me of that one Bloodborne arena, but it doesn't really get better than that. Sure, the gameplay is decent, but it all boils down to projectile. You hit her once, she floats away while casting some tracking spells and repeat. She does have an interesting arsenal of spells though. She's got a Comet of Zero, a regular Comet, a Moon Spell, and some other cool ones. When she gets to her second phase, she even utilizes summoning magic to defeat you. She can summon wolves, bloodhound knights, trolls, and even a dragon. All these summons are fairly balanced though as they do reduce damage and disappear after a couple of seconds. Other than that, this boss had so much potential to be amazing, but FromSoft yet again made another magic spamming average boss. We have officially reached optimal levels for the mediocre bosses. No more bosses that I consider to be bad are on the rankings anymore. And we'll start off the mediocrity with a Magma Worm. He's your basic beast type enemy with large, wide movements and sufficient damage. The semi-interesting thing about Makar is that he has a giant ass sword. Not every day do you see a giant ass worm with arms wield a sword that does AoE attacks. His entire second phase is honestly not that bad, and can be pretty cool sometimes. But that's really all Makar has going for him. The first part of his fight consists of him just clumsily shuffling around while spewing red magma everywhere. These lava puddles are unfortunately pretty annoying. They constantly stun you if you're in them, and good luck if you find yourself directly in the center of one. This boss is the definition of meh. Leonine is a goddamn sleeper boss. You slack off just a few times and he can easily kill you even if you're overleveled. Just one combo from him can send you into critical health or just death, but all that doesn't make him any more fun to fight against. He's got a couple of awkward attacks and some tricky to dodge ones, but most of his moves are just average. I will say his boss arena and setting are pretty cool for an early game area. The rain in the background and the reflections from the wet sandy beach make the fight look pretty decent. You know, this is a short but fairly sweet boss. Nothing too annoying, nothing too fun, just a common boss fight. He's like the Taurus demon of Elden Ring. You might have noticed already, but I do not enjoy fighting big creature type bosses. I greatly prefer fighting the knight or humanoid type bosses. And while this statement is pretty true, I don't think Estelle is that bad. He can honestly be enjoyable at some times. The way Estelle's visuals flow together is insanely good though. The particle effects look crisp as hell and the arena and visual boss design is top tier. But with all these visuals, it turns out just to be a mediocre fight again. Estelle loves to hit you with these slow, powerful attacks that create space and then teleport away with an AoE. Well you see, that type of boss gameplay loot to me isn't what I like. Estelle makes up for this though by having some cool looking and fun to dodge attacks. His laser beam is hard to dodge at first, but once you get the rhythm, it's so satisfying to get the timing down. Estelle also has this gravity ground pulse which is very satisfying to dodge as well. He's got a cool looking grab attack too, and although I didn't get the footage for it, the grab attack duplicates himself like 10 times, and then he grabs you with all his claws. I used to hate Estelle, but now that i fought him with a clear mindset, I've got to admit, he's not that bad. I know what you might be thinking, Dragonkin Soldier? That fight is fucking ass. Well, I'm talking about the Ice Lightning one. That one is actually alright. Now, obviously the first phase moveset is rather underwhelming, as it's mainly just slow, wide swipes and an occasional AoE ground slam, but once you activate a second phase, the fight actually gets rather intense. He leaps up and does these frost lightning AoE slams, while my frame rate drops to like 15 frames per second, but it still looks amazing. Seeing the spectacle of the Dragonkin fly his fat little body in the air while he chucks an Ice Lightning Spear at you is pretty fun. We're starting to get to the level where bosses actually have interesting overall qualities to them. The Dragonkin Soldier is one of them. That is of course the Lightning one. The normal ones suck ass to be honest.
You know, over my couple years of playing Elden Ring, I keep hearing that Red Wolf Radagon is kind of a shitty boss. But from my experience, he's actually not so bad. And for being a wolf, they could have made him look very generic, but Radagon's design is far from that. He's got this orange flowing hair, and if you look closely, you can see that he's got some jewelry and piercings, which I think is really cute. And the arena of this boss fight supports its cinematic factor as well. Seeing how the debate parlay gets dynamically obliterated in the fight is a great sight to experience. Now let's talk about the gameplay, which is unfortunately where some of the problems arise from. Radagon will try and hit you with various attacks from his sword that he just conjures out of thin air, and those attacks are pretty enjoyable. And he also has these various swipes and physical attacks which sort of feel awkward to maneuver around to be honest, but my main gripe with this fight is him just constantly running and jumping all over the place while he spams that phalanx blade attack. This paired together with the crowded debate parlor can be an absolute nightmare. You're going crazy running around the arena and shit, and then you come to a complete stop because one fucking table just stops you. I know it's a very minor gripe, and once the fight goes on, eventually all the destructibles will be, well, destructed, but either way, running around and dodging his magic pressure is kind of a nuisance. Coming in at number 18, we have what is probably the most obese boss in Elden Ring. I can't believe they got the real Boogie 2988 to do the mocap and voice acting. Oh, oh shit. No, but seriously, this is the wackiest boss design in this game. A fat fucking Redditor noble with a rapier who is wearing skin as armor is one of the most interesting and weirdest things I've ever seen. He's even got attacks that derive from his visual design, like the belly bounce attacks and the rolling attacks. But how does this boss hold up gameplay-wise? Well, it's alright. And by the noble's placement, you can tell it's a little worse than its twin counterpart. The godskin noble hits you with these extremely strange and oddly telegraphed thrust attacks with his rapier. Some of them are easy to dodge, but sometimes I find myself just constantly spamming the roll button as I have no idea when and how fast he's going to attack. He's got other attacks like his notorious roll attack, which honestly is what makes him inferior to his counterpart. I have no idea if this issue is specific to me, but I cannot roll through this attack even if my life depended on it. I'm not sure if you have to roll perfectly or just not roll at all, but I can't seem to dodge it. And in his second phase, the Noble gains a powered up moveset, with his particularly annoying belly slam attack being used. Its startup animation is so goddamn quick, I refuse to believe anyone can dodge this. The fun part is actually dodging his ground slam attack. That shit's satisfying. In conclusion, the Godskin Noble is an interesting looking boss that can be fun at times. Nile is an irritating boss to talk about. Is it Neil? Nile? I'm just gonna go with Nile. Many people, including me, have a lot to say about him, so let's start. So, the main point of interest when talking about Nile happens in the first few seconds of the fight. He immediately spawns two bandaged knights, the one on the left being the sword and shield guy, and the one on the right being the dual swordsman guy. Now, these two knights completely ruined the fight for me. Niall is very passive when these two guys are alive, but that doesn't matter at all since two giant knights are still chasing you. Their AI clearly wasn't designed to perform a fair gank fight. One of them just isn't passive, and they both demolish you and don't give a shit about if it's a fair fight or not. Now let's think of some strategies to defeat them. 1. Fight one of them in a 1v1. Yeah, because that's totally going to work. The other one is just going to do its leap attack and then they'll one-shot you. 2. Do heavy attacks while they're grouped together. This seems like a good idea, but if you don't have a big enough weapon, you aren't going to do shit. It's more than likely that you won't stun them and they'll just bulldoze through your attacks. Three. Use summons, like the game probably intended you to do. <laughs> no, we aren't going to use summons on this ranking. Even though I'm 99% sure that this boss incentivizes you to do so, we still aren't going to use summons. 4. Either immediately kill one of them at the start, or run around the arena and wait a couple of hours to find an opening. This is probably the only strategy that works efficiently. You most likely have to either kill one of them with high burst damage at the start, or just wait it out until you can strike. As you saw in one of those clips, the knights basically one-shot you if you fuck up. They have combos that are strings of continuous high damaging attacks, but since they stun you, it basically feels like a one-hit KO. And as you can see, this just isn't fun. Not at all. But let's talk about the actual good part, or even the great part about this fight. Nile. Nile is surprisingly a very fun boss to fight, and paired with him are some of the heaviest looking moves in the game. His veteran's prosthesis conducts lightning, and he can swing his flagpole staff around to create huge ice storm windup attacks. His attacks are visually explosive and are very cinematic. He's just got this rhythm to him that makes this fight so memorable. Parrying Nile is also stupidly satisfying and easy to pull off. Combine all that together and you've got a very fun boss. And then you remember that the two knights at the start exist. And now you know why this boss isn't ranked any lower than it should be. And here we have the Godskin Apostle. I'll try to explain why I think he's better than the Godskin Noble. 
You see, the reason why Skinny is better than Fat is because Skinny seems to have an actual rhythm to the fight. I've probably said this many times by now, and I'll say it again in the future, but I feel like having a sense of flow and rhythm is just what makes a fight click. I hate dodging awkward, randomly timed attacks that don't feel natural. I much prefer the fast combos and intense gameplay of a boss that has flow to it. This is exactly what applies to the Godskin Twins. Skinny just has flashier looking attacks and faster paced attacks that require much more precision and skill to dodge. Where Fatty has the roll and black flame firewall, Skinny has a black flame tornado and a helicopter attack. And these moves are much more engaging than Fatty's. It's a fairly simple boss, but you know, I like it. Alright, just like in my last video, we've come to the point where these next bosses don't have any inherent flaws applied to them. Gone are the mediocre and uninteresting bosses, and in come the actual impressive bosses that Elden Ring gives us. We'll start off these good bosses with the real Loretta, not the fake one. You'll find her in one of the last areas of the game, which is the Halleck Tree, and she acts as a final obstacle before Melania. And I just have to say, this arena is goddamn beautiful. I don't know how to explain it, but sometimes Elden Ring's lighting and reflection engine just looks decent, and then sometimes it looks like this. This arena is one of the best arenas in Elden Ring, but are the visuals of this arena the only thing going for this boss fight? Well, not this time actually. Loretta shares the same Knight on a Horse subclass that commonly appears in Elden Ring, and this time it's a Magic Knight. Surprisingly, she's one of the only magic enemies that I think is fun to fight against. Even though she's got an abundance of carry and spells, she doesn't spam them. And she's got a wonderful balance of fundamental melee attacks mixed with some quick magic attacks. And Loretta also has her magic bow, which looks intimidating in the best way possible. She doesn't run away from you the entire fight like most magic themed bosses. She would rather fight you in a more offensive way, which I absolutely love. Elden Ring's fast paced combat comes into play here when you get deep in the fight. Dodging these weighty glaive attacks is exactly why I play this game. She cinematic and fun to actually fight. Overall, Loretta is a great boss. I think the Draconic Tree Sentinel is a bit better than Loretta. He's got a more exciting moveset and he's far more aggressive. Draconic Tree Sentinel, I'll just call him DTS from now on, is one of the few non-achievement bosses that is required to beat the game. You'll find him guarding the entrance to Leyendel, one of the major mid-game areas in Elden Ring. Now if you fought the normal tree sentinel at the start of the game, you'll instantly recognize his memorable moveset. But this time, DTS has red lightning to spice up his attacks. Again, he's already got some base moves from his parent class, which automatically makes his moveset better. His first phase gives him the impression of just a tougher looking tree sentinel, but once you get him into his second phase, he unlocks his draconic lightning attacks, which are just stunning. It's honestly horrifying seeing this badass steel knight just leaping at you with this giant AoE attack. He's also got this lightning shield attack that is well telegraphed and oddly satisfying to dodge. DTS's horse can also spew fireballs at you which is just the cherry on top, it's amazing. He sort of reminds me of a scaled down version of the Nameless King from Dark Souls 3. He's riding an animal that can also attack you, he's got similar lightning attacks like the vertical slam one, and he does massive damage. The DTS is a great mid game boss fight to check your reaction time and gameplay skills before you get into Landell. Man, Godric is an intense boss. This motherfucker is insane. Like, he's freaky. I bet he's freaky. Godric's a great boss. He's the final foe you face before exiting the notorious Stormvale castle, and he sure puts up a fight. Now, if you were playing the game for the first time, you fought Margit and maybe some other bosses, but once you enter this fog gate, this is probably going to be your toughest looking and fighting boss yet. Godric is just this crafted maniac psychopath that attaches other people's body parts onto his. He's got like 15 arms and wields this great axe that is like twice the size of your character. Don't lie, you were 100% intimidated by this dude on your first playthrough. Godric will throw out these tough to time axe attacks and hand swipes, bringing out these drawn out and flashy combos that are well designed. He's also got these storm attacks that have him either throwing wind at you or leaping up in the air thinking that he's Gale. This first phase gets you used to his unique moveset and sets you up for his climax, which is the second phase. Similar to Morgoth, he just yells obscurities and chops off his own arm. And then he sticks his severed stump into a dragon head as it reanimates. And then it turns out he can breathe fire out the dragon head as it screams bear witness. Like this has no right to be this goofy. The voice acting is top tier though, I have to admit. The soundtrack comes blasting in as he opens up with this approaching fire breath attack, and it makes for another memorable moment in this fight. He only unlocks a few more minor moves, but other than that, it's just Godric but amplified. 
I just get this insane rush every time I fight Godric, it's addicting. Elden Ring's introduction to a great rune boss is done respectfully here. This is a one of a kind and surprisingly fun fight. Okay, I know what you might be thinking, but I strongly think that this fight is overhated. I used to think like that too though. I thought that the Godskin duo was the worst duo boss fight that FromSoft has ever made and that it would be ranked horribly in this video. But after I recently fought the Valiant Gargoyles in the Godskin duo this playthrough, I've had big turnarounds in my opinions. I gotta admit, I like the Godskin duo. It's obviously not in the top 10, but I still really enjoy it. It's the ultimate test of skill you'll face up until this point and it's a balanced one too. Now that I think about it, I don't even know why I hated the Godskin duel in the first place. I honestly bandwagon, which is pretty funny to me. But let's start talking about the balance. It's almost cooked to perfection. These two guys never overwhelm or explicitly 2v1 you. It's rare if you would find yourself getting ganked by both of these guys. And by ganked, I mean like the Valiant Gargoyles ganked like attacking you at the same time and shit. They follow that fundamental rule where only one guy gets aggressive and the other dude sits back and maybe throws a projectile at you once in a while. And these two just have the perfect amount of aggression. If this fight was just one dude sitting in the back and doing nothing while the other guy was aggressive towards you, it would be kind of boring, right? But instead what they did was genius. They first set the aggressor's AI to a normal 1v1 fight as usual, but then they just added a minuscule amount of aggression to the supposed passive guy. And then that just creates a wonderful formula of 2v1 fights. It shapes the fight to be this back and forth constant battle that rarely involves the player just running around and waiting for an opportunity to attack. Oh, and another thing to mention, remember that annoying fat roll attack that the noble has? Well, they added pillars around the arena to create spacing for that, which is a nice little added bonus. I got one more thing to point out, the soundtrack. This track is severely underrated when it comes to the big bosses of this game, and I absolutely love it. It makes the fight so much more intense and that much better. Rykard is an unhinged boss fight. This might be the most abnormal boss in Elden Ring. He is the franchise's reoccurring gimmick fight, and staying true to the formula, you receive a windstorm weapon to defeat a giant boss. FromSoft has certainly learned from their past mistakes, and I think they wanted to make this their greatest gimmick fight yet, and it shows. It's not too easy, but not too hard and frustrating. It's got that iconic cool factor, and it's memorable. They really said, hey, take this spear version of the Storm Ruler and kill this giant snake with a face that can talk. And yes, when he talks, it sounds... well, I'll just say it sounds interesting. You gain access to the Serpent Hunter, a sword spear that gives you wind-powered attacks. It has this devastating weapon art that straight up looks like an anime fight. Rykard's first phase has you up against the Serpent that basically lets you test out the Serpent Hunter. It's an easy first phase, but his second phase is where shit starts to get crazy. It turns out Rykard was behind the serpent the entire time, and he pulls a sword out of the serpent's throat, saying some goofy shit. And once he gets access to his sword, the fight turns from wacky to bad shit insane. His perfectly telegraphed sword attacks are just so satisfying to dodge, and then he's got these skull projectiles with like a billion particles on screen, it's absolute chaos. This is literally like YouTube Shorts brain rot with so much going on at the screen. <laughs> His second phase is definitely where he gets his notoriety from, and this is certainly another unforgettable gimmick fight that FromSoft has made. I just had to put him in the spot because of how fun this fight is. I bet you didn't expect this little guy to be in the top 10. Oh yeah, and speaking of top 10, well we're at the top 10. And starting off this top 10 list, we have Elmer. I think this guy is the most underrated boss in Elden Ring. He's not the biggest boss, he's not the most bombastic, and he's certainly not the toughest boss, but he is so extraordinarily good at being flashy and well-rounded. Elmer doesn't have any special cutscene or dialogue though, but rather just an extremely solid and grounded moveset that is just so fun to play against. He's got a set of unpredictable but rather consistent attacks while still offering an enjoyable challenge. You'll find him swinging his goddamn executioner sword like a Jedi with these crimson telekinetic slams. 
Every arsenal in his unconfined moveset just flows beautifully during the fight, and there is not a single moment where I experience an unfair attack. Just plain old fighting. Like look at this shit man, how can you see this footage and tell me that this boss isn't amazing? It's always the classic knight enemies that win me over in Souls games. You can't ever go wrong with the tried and true humanoid with armor and a sword. Name a single bad knight boss in FromSoft games. They're always just absolute bangers. Hey wait, n that, that guy doesn't count. My only issue with this amazing boss is honestly just laziness on FromSoft's part. They gave the dude with the most badass name, barbed wire armor, fucking Jedi floating sword attacks, and a lifesteal fist only to give him a horribly underwhelming soundtrack. He's just treated like a common enemy in the castle. Imagine how much better this fight would have been if they gave this dude some deep ass dialogue at the start and gave him some menacing theme, but instead we just got this generic open world boss theme that Elden Ring copies and pastes. Like that's it? It's unfortunate, but I guess it is what it is. Overall, an unforgettable boss in my opinion. I'm guessing some of you might be surprised on why Margaret is all the way down on this list with the big boys, but let me explain. While he technically can be the first boss in the game, that doesn't make him any less worthy of being top tier. Again, in my Dark Souls 3 ranking video, I said Udix Gundir was teaching the player on how to succeed in Dark Souls 3's new combat system. Well, Margaret is literally doing the exact same thing, but better. The first thing Margaret teaches you is how to work the ropes of Elden Ring, familiarizing you with the classic but unique combat system. Elden Ring is like Dark Souls 3 if it took two heaping piles of crack cocaine. If you came straight from Dark Souls 3, it'd be like switching from Doom 2016 to Doom Eternal. It's noticeably faster, a lot more dynamic, and has an excruciatingly larger amount of delayed attacks. And if you came from Dark Souls 1, it'd be like switching from fucking Pong to Ultra Kill. Elden Ring's bosses have a much wider arsenal of moves and behaviors than any other previous Souls bosses. Margaret alone, which is essentially just a tutorial boss, has like four different combo strings he can destroy you with. Elden Ring also introduces jumping, which is another great option for the more aggressive players. Finally, the infamous delayed attacks. The delayed attacks have always been memed since Elden Ring's launch, and it is continuously memed to this day. Margaret's delayed swings threw me off when I first played Elden Ring, as delayed attacks weren't very common in the Soul series, but I think we eventually all got used to them. And when Margaret gets down to half health, his second phase just abruptly appears, and it teaches the player Elden Ring's other big change, the second phases. Bosses in this game go absolutely crazy during their phase change, and Margaret is no exception. He unlocks like two new combo strings and can destroy panic rollers. Margaret is the perfect tutorial boss in my opinion. Rattles out the weeds, panic rollers, and teaches the player to go out and explore if the boss is too hard. So many fundamental Elden Ring mechanics are learned at this starting point, and that's where most of my love for Margaret comes from. He's fun as hell too and can still catch me off guard, even after beating Elden Ring many many times. Guys, I have to admit something. I actually don't really enjoy the Malekith fight. It's kind of ass and it's one of the worst late game bosses in Elden Ring. That is for the first part of course. I have to rip the bandit off and just say that I dislike the beast clergyman fight. I do wish they shortened the fight against the clergyman and compensated for a longer quality Malekith fight. The beast clergyman is just such a mixed bag for me. At one point he can feel like an actual great boss with a back and forth battle type feeling and then other times he jumps 40 feet away from you to throw his shitty little rock pebbles. And he does have his fair share of awkward and frankly horrible attacks, but the rest of the fight is fine as long as you have the damage to quickly dispose of him in the first phase. But now let's talk about the juicy part of the fight, which is Malekith himself. Looking like he came straight out of Berserk, Malekith just spawns inside of the beast clergyman, and you realize that the dude you were giving the death roots to was Malekith all along. And after that interesting cutscene, he does his little anime pose, and then it transitions into gameplay. Malekith presents a brand new mechanic in the Soul series, which is the life drain and reducing max HP mechanic in an active boss fight. This happens literally every time you get hit with one of his destined death moves, incentivizing you to perfect his attack patterns and to not be greedy. And when you finally do memorize his attack patterns, it feels great. It's like you're on the dance floor just gracefully shifting through Malekith's swipes. Malekith's got perfectly spaced slashing moves he can perform with his comically sized sword, like this shit is crazy man. He also dynamically leaps atop the pillars in the boss room, just to attack you with spinning blade projectile beams and then slams down into you. Now this is how you do projectiles in a boss fight. Don't make them obnoxious and spammable, just make them with quality and scarcity. And not to mention, this is probably the best looking arena graphically. Sometimes Elden Ring's graphics just click, and this is one of those times. The godways and the tornadoes raging in the background just add so much to the visuals and atmosphere to the battle. 
And did you know you can actually parry Malekith? By using the Blasphemous Claw item, you can do so, and the way they handle the parry mechanic is genius. The Blasphemous Claw is similar to those helpful items that can be used against bosses' weaknesses, and this time, instead of having a 3-use only policy like the Shackles, the Claw can be used whenever Malekith's blade shines gold. So this makes the player have to learn Malekith's attacks again, and to stay diligent for the right time to parry. And when you do get that parry off, it's so satisfying, man. You can't repost him, but it does give you a massive window to attack him. Anyways, my only complaints are that some of his attacks are simply just not fair. For example, his destined death little anime slash thing is so impossibly irritating to dodge. You have to be at the right place, the right time, and with lucky positioning, you might just be able to dodge it. Other than that, this is a top tier boss. I'll give the medal for the most cinematic boss to Placidus X, hands down, not even close. The sheer spectacle of this fight is just on another level compared to any other boss. Let me just go through the list of crazy stuff with you. So if I'm correct, you literally go back in time in Faramazula, rebuild the center building, and then you see this giant ass floating double headed dragon egg just levitating in the center. All while you are set in what I think is in the best arena in the game. This boss right here is Elden Ring's cinematic factor at its best. The cool factor is unmatched, and it can't get any better than this. Unfortunately, and I hate to say this, but this boss's gameplay isn't perfect. It's not very consequential in the bigger picture, but these problems still plague the boss fight a little. And that problem is... the first phase. It's your typical Elden Ring dragon fight with monotonous claw swipes, tail whips, and some annoying fire breath. Hey, at least this dragon stays still for the first phase, unlike other dragons, but man, the second phase is where actual good shit starts. Placidus X floats up in the air and vanishes first, leaving the player anticipating on what's gonna happen next. The player knows something's coming, and they're probably scared out of their mind. Then, some red lightning rumbles in the distance as you shit your pants, and bam, a goddamn red claw swipe swings into you at a million miles per hour. And wait a minute, it's not done yet. The whole second phase revolves around a faster and harder hitting red lightning physical variation. Placidus X is phasing in and out of the map, constantly hitting the player with conjured claw attacks. And then after that, he finishes with a Medir like laser beam attack that has devastating damage and rightfully so. It literally feels like you're in a cutscene, but you can actually control your character. But I mean yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say. What a marvel of a boss fight. For the longest time, I actually used to be the biggest Morgoth hater, but as of recently, I think he's one of the best boss fights in the game, and now that I think about it, he's literally just Morgoth multiplied by 10. Back when Elden Ring first launched in 2022, I was one of those Moonvale Rivers of Blood jump attack bleed spammers who beat the shit out of their dodge button, and Morgoth is a boss that perfectly counters this type of playstyle, thus making me despise him. But after beating all the bosses again during this playthrough, my opinion has drastically changed. Learning against Morgoth was one of the most rewarding ways to play Elden Ring. It literally changed how I play Elden Ring today. When the cutscene starts, you'll be thinking, didn't I already fight this bum at the start? How did he come back? But then he just casually burns the crust off of his staff and gets a goddamn Damascus camo curve sword like he just unlocked a Call of Duty camo. Now, Morgoth is sort of like the Pontiff Sullivan of Elden Ring. He's precisely a mid-game boss that acts as a skill and DPS check for the player. If you've been panic rolling the entire game, this time he'll make sure you put an end to that bad habit. His animations for his attacks might seem awkward and deceitful at first, but once you focus and just lock in, it flows so naturally. And I know it might sound like a broken record at this point, but Morgoth just has that rhythm and flow inside of him that makes the arena feel like a dance when you're fighting him. Appealing combo strings and golden incantations is what makes this fight so special. And just like with Margit, Morgoth has special tricks coming up his sleeve for round 2. And when I said coming, I literally meant coming. Because when he engages in second phase, he shits and explodes everywhere while just screaming at the top of his lungs. No, but seriously, this fight goes from 0 to 100 in a fraction of a second. The weather becomes gloomy and atmospheric, the music changes, he gets more aggressive, and he gets access to the cursed blood blade moves. Holy fuck, these are one of the most terrifying grab attacks in the game. This shit makes me want to run across the entire arena just to avoid him. Dodging this delayed grab attack is euphorically rewarding though, holy shit. But man, this second phase is something else. It's another level of fun. I love this little guy. Alright, we've officially made it into the top 5 bosses. Get ready because these bosses have some absolutely insane showcases. And we're going to kick off this top 5 with the final boss of the game. Although this boss made it into the top 5, it is without a doubt the most disappointing boss on this list. I know that sounds really bad, but let me just explain my opinions. Radagon is such a top tier final boss. You've got the arena, the moveset, the animation fluidity, the difficulty, and the music. I fucking love the trope where games use the final boss's music as the main menu's music. This shit works so well here. 
They even used this song in the announcement trailer, which makes it even more iconic. Again, it sounds like I'm repeating myself over and over again, but this fight just feels so smooth and flows so well. None of his attacks are unfair, except for this teleport, but that doesn't even count because the rest of this fight is just so good. Battling out with Radagon while the Elden Ring theme song is just rumbling in the background is one of FromSoft's best moments in their games. And if you watch the whole intro cutscene, the part where Radagon appears on the screen with his hammer in his fist, just posing like an absolute badass is incredible. Radagon is essentially a husk controlled by the Elden Beast, and when you fight him with the music going on in the background, you can feel the pain, suffering, and determination that Radagon has gone through fighting for the Golden Order. And for us, the Tarnished, this theme in battle is a product of every obstacle and setback that the Tarnished has reached up until this part in their journey. The Ur-Tree is burnt to a crisp, the world is on the brink of chaos, and this is the conclusion of our journey. We're not trapped in here with Radagon, but Radagon is trapped in here with us. And as our last boss from our journey to take the Elden Throne, we face Radagon, inside of the Ur-Tree. What a way to fucking end it, man. To me, everything about this fight is just perfection. And a part of me hates myself because I didn't put him lower on the list, but I'm sure you all know why he isn't lower on the list. It starts with E and rhymes with Elden Feast. That's right, it's the dreaded Elden Beast. Now, I'm not one of those guys who just absolutely hates Elden Beast with all my heart, but I don't like the fight either. It's just the most disappointing, underwhelming, sorry-ass excuse for a final boss on the list. If FromSoft made a second phase for a stronger, more intense final form of Radagon, this fight would easily be the best on this list, no doubt about it. But they just had to put in this greasy little golden creature. I mean, I get it, this fight isn't supposed to be some grand final battle, but rather an emotional and beautiful end to Elden Ring. But that's fucking stupid! For me, personally, I hate calm and depressing final boss fights in video games. But except Gwyn, because it fits the setting perfectly. But this is Elden Ring we're talking about here, not Dark Souls. Elden Ring is its own journey, its own world, and not nearly as depressing as Dark Souls. Ending with a bang was the best thing they could have done here, but they just choked. They just bait us with this mediocre Pokemon looking thing that runs away from you like literally 70% of the fight and just spams the most vile projectiles at you which is my personal worst combination for a boss to have. Most of its attacks are just gimmick moves like this pathetic jumping ring attack, Elden Stars which is like near impossible to dodge, and the Golden Wave. Once Elden Beast pulls out his sword and begins to do some cool stuff, it's already over. I mean, at least they got the arena right, it's pretty captivating, but I don't even want to talk about this fight anymore, it's just such a letdown. Radagon carries this final boss fight so hard that it made it into number 5. Gosh, I don't even know where to start with Radon. It's just such a creative boss fight that's got so many positives residing within it. This is what I consider to be the first boss on this list with no flaws. It's perfect. Every other boss after this boss is perfect, but just better in their own way, if you understand what I mean. Well, let's break Radon down. Radon is the only boss in this playthrough where I use summons, but the summons manage to make the fight even better regardless. You see, you actually get to summon various warriors during the battle with Radon, and all of them recur from that buildup during the fight, which was that wacky Radon festival. You've got the big jar guy, Blyde, and many more. Charging at Radon with all the boys while he shoots these laser beam arrows at you is one of the most hype feelings in any video game, period. You literally climb up a mountainous sand hill with all your phantom friends towards this menacing warrior sitting on a tiny horse. It manages to be one of the silliest scenes ever and one of the hardest scenes ever. Fighting Radon with your buddies in the first phase is perfect because he's got a wide range of sweeping and combo attacks that feel perfect to dodge. And then when you get him down to around half health, he skyrockets into the air and hold on, cut the music, cut the music. He reappears in the distance, becoming a fiery hey bro, meatball just it. headed towards you at watch the speed it, of light. And if that isn't the best second phase entrance I've seen in a video game, I don't know what is. I even think the time of day changes to the starry night, which is basically indicating that Radon turned into the sun and charged at you. I remember when Elden Ring first launched, videos about this guy were just everywhere, making him an icon today. 
And for pre-patched Radon, this attack would have probably one-shotted you. Wait, what the fuck? Ain't no way I do all that and then he leaves. I- What the fuck? I if I remember correctly, now it doesn't do as much damage. And I honestly regret how the Radon nerf disabled this mechanic, but I kind of understand how getting one shot wasn't that fun. But pre-patch Radon or not, this boss's second phase is still mesmerizing. Instead of just being a great basic boss on its own, Radon uses the full power of his gravity magic, gaining a ton of new attacks. Just fucking sending gravity waves at you and turning into a goddamn purple drill. This shit is on another level, man. A lot of people during Elden Ring's release were saying that Radon was the hardest boss in this game, and I would have completely agreed. I always rush to Radon when I get the chance to fight him just because of how funny he is to fight, whether that be solo or with friends. Upon my name as Godfrey, the first Elden Lord. Now if that doesn't scream peak boss, I don't even know what does anymore. Godfrey sits atop the Elden Throne, being one of the last bosses you fight during the end of Elden Ring, and he sure brings the hype for being a memorable endgame boss. Godfrey's probably one of the only bosses that uses tarnished in a non-derogatory slur type of way. He respects the player, making me respect his fight even more. He's also one of those bosses that makes me never want to beat him, and just endlessly dodges attacks. You know which ones I'm talking about. He is seriously that fun. It's just a constant alternating battle with Godfrey's axe swings, foot stomps, and your counterattacks that feels like a fucking rhythm game in the best way possible. Godfrey is also another boss that incentivizes jumping like Godric. It's perfectly paced and perfectly balanced. The sounds of the cracking earth and the soundtrack, mixed with the setting of the flaming earth tree, turns this first phase into a thrill. Speaking of phases, Godfrey's technically got like three phases. He's got his first phase, then his second phase, which is while he's still in Godfrey form, and then his third WWE wrestler phase. But I honestly like the first phase better than his second, due to its consistency. The introduction to the AoE stomps in his second phase make them a lot more satisfying to dodge and it ramps up the intensity greatly. Rolling these cross-map AoE shockwaves are scarily fun to perform. Now let's talk about the third phase, where Godfrey just fucking rips his giant lion off of his back, subsequently turning into this wrestler dude straight out of God of War. And this shit jump scared me when I first fought this dude. Literally right when his phase transition cutscene ends, he's programmed to always open up with this delayed charged grab attack. I literally passed out when it hit me, and I died, just like that. His axe is gone, and he introduces an entire new moveset, with it revolving around physical brute strength attacks. Godfrey goes full psycho mode here, and it looks like he's done putting up with your shit, taking the gloves off. He snatches you with a bear hug, and then leaps up 50 feet, smashing you down at a billion miles per hour. Kind of like with Sister Free from DS3, it's actually fun to be grabbed for once, just to see the animation. But yeah, this boss has a legendary status and will never be forgotten. He's one of my favorite FromSoft bosses ever. Moog has my favorite soundtrack in Elden Ring, and that's saying a lot, considering the large amount of amazing soundtracks in this game. His theme alone would carry him into the top 5. That's how disgustingly good it is. You could definitely argue that Moog could be the best boss in the game, but I'm saving that for you know who. Every time I fight this dude, I just get this zesty ass tingling feeling because I'm just gonna have a blast having this showdown with Moog. Everything about Moog is just so metal, and his character design is unmatched. You could probably already tell this, but I know next to nothing about Elden Ring's lore. But I do know that Moog has done some despicable things, let's just say that. He's got this giant trident that has some delayed behaviors, but once you get used to it, it's the most satisfying thing in the game to just dance around. Moog also has a wide variety of blood and blood flame incantations in his bloody arsenal. He can swipe his claw and create this delayed claw explosion, and he can also literally summon a portal to another dimension to get some blood and throw it on you. That has got to be one of the best little details in this game. Another insanely creative mechanic Moog has is his Latin countdown shit. He counts down from 3 while placing hexes on you, creating the suspense of impending doom. Fighting Moog in this first phase while this devilish medieval tone plays in the background, and while he's menacingly counting down your death is what does it for me. Oh no! 
no other boss has a theme and tone that competes with Moog. You also might have noticed that Moog isn't immune to bleed. You'd think that the Lord of Blood himself would be immune to hemorrhaging attacks, but in fact he's actually weak to them. And there's a crazy explanation to this supposed oversight. Moog serves a god that craves wounds, and the point of his character and people that serve him is to worship pain and obviously blood. Now after saying that, Moog gets this disgusting pleasure out of bleeding. He even obtains a damage boost when he bleeds, which supports this theory of loving pain and bleeding even more. It's such a good detail. Now let's talk about his most famous move. You know the one I'm talking about. The first time I fought this dude, I got annihilated by this attack, but I couldn't even be mad. The way they deal with the balance is honestly fair too. You can either get the item that deals with the curse, or just tough it out and chug three flasks. Either way, it still looks badass. And in his second phase, he grows feathery wings and gets some new attacks. But the second phase is basically using everything that you've learned in his first phase to adapt and overcome his second phase, which I really enjoy. He starts to just ejaculate blood flame everywhere, but it doesn't really do anything though, it's more for cinematic value. Whenever I'm done with this fight, I just wish I could reset my save file and do it all over again. It's that good. It's not quite the best though, and I think you know who's coming next. That's right, it's Melania. You either hate her or you love her, but in my opinion, I think she's the best boss in Elden Ring, which is an extremely tough task to pull off, since this game has some of the best bosses that FromSoft has ever made. Although Melania might not go down as the most universally liked boss in gaming, I 100% think she'll go down as one of the most iconic bosses in gaming. Melania had successfully broken the internet when people were first fighting her. Every streamer, YouTuber, and even myself were trying to beat the proclaimed hardest boss ever. Everything about her is just so memorable. From her intro cutscene, her difficulty, and her voice lines. She was born with Scarlet Rot, causing her mind and body to become decayed and rotted off, creating this crazy interesting character design. But enough with the boring stuff, let's talk about the fight. The player enters the roots of the Hallow Tree, and sitting next to the roots, you find Melania. And then... Oh shit. Yo, I'll be back. One second. Alright guys, I'm back. Uh, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Melania straight up tells you she has never known defeat, which is probably not the most promising thing to hear right before fighting a boss. But as the hardest boss in Elden Ring, I wouldn't doubt her. Don't let her size fool you, because she packs a punch. Every move is just combo after combo after grab after combo after thrust attack. And every move she throws at you, you gotta dodge perfectly. And on top of all of that, she heals herself every time you get hit. And then she also has that one move, that I'm sure you're all aware of, and that is Waterfowl. Waterfowl is something you learn to appreciate over time. I know when I was trying to beat her for the first time, I wanted to rip my eyes out and delete this shit game, but over the years of experience I've had with Elden Ring, learning, mastering, and flawlessly rolling Waterfowl as well as her entire moveset is the most gratifying experience in the game. Finally getting that flawless waterfowl is so worth it, and if you haven't already, you should try to. Another fun mechanic you can perform in Melania's fight is parrying. Parrying a boss hasn't felt this good since Gwyn. And parrying bosses in Elden Ring is a little different though, since most of the time it takes 2 or 3 parries. But this just makes them even more rewarding in the end. Once you learn to parry every single one of Melania's attacks, the fight will be much more manageable and much more fun too. Finally, let's discuss Melania's second and final phase. She takes off her clothes and... wait... Another one? For free? Okay, I'm back. Melania shows her true rotten goddess form, only gaining a couple of new attacks, but those attacks she gains are so good. She also changes up her moveset, making the player adapt to Scarlet Rot, and different combo ending moves. Not only that, but she becomes like two times more aggressive, and she gets her rotten clone rush attack, which is downright insane. Fighting her while this amazing score is playing, transforms this fight into the most intense and threatening battle with extreme stakes, and if you die, you gotta beat that long ass first phase again. Which is not even a punishment because I get to fight Melania even more. Her theme is so special because it has this constant tone of descending and despair. When I fight Melania with the song on, I get this indescribable feeling of dread, which makes me love the fight even more.
Even myself, who has beaten Melania many, many times, had trouble fighting this boss. I think I died like 8 times in this playthrough to her. And even after defeating her this many times, hearing her death dialogue and seeing the victory achieved text is just the perfect end to this boss. Never has beating a boss been this rewarding. Melania has left a legacy on everyone who's beaten her, and whether it being good or bad, you have to admit, it was iconic. She is the fundamental and central icon of From Software's Souls-like genre of video games, and she serves as a learning point for anyone who plays video games, whether they are veterans or newcomers. She is the lifeblood of that unmatchable feeling of accomplishment for overcoming an insurmountable challenge of this scale. Melania will always be my favorite boss in this game. That is, until the DLC comes out. Who knows what we'll find there? But yeah, that's it. I guess Melania is pretty good. Hey, thanks for watching my video until the end. Sorry it was very long, but I still had fun making it. I got a lot of support on my last video and I just wanted to say thanks. If you disagree or want to correct any of my points made in this video, feel free to do so in the comment section below and I will try to respond. At the end of the day, these are just my personal opinions and I can totally understand if you have different takes. Having different takes is just the beauty of opinions, but thanks for watching. I'll probably do a separate ranking of the DLC bosses when they come out, so yeah. Elden Ring's a pretty good game. Bye!